pleasure to be uh, to be back to in-person think tanks. It's um, a long three years, um, but it's, it just makes such a big difference catching up with old pals like very old pals like Mark uh, and a few others, and and some new friends, of course. So um, terrific. Well, our, our last one was uh, was three years ago, just just at the time, of course, that the Tory Party had booted out its leader um, and then Prime Minister the hapless Theresa May. I think I referred to her as hopeless three years ago, so I'm being slightly more polite, uh, but she was hopeless. Um, anyway, that new leader that was, was appointed then went on a few months later to win a landslide general election victory, the biggest for the Tories since the Thatcher era, and he finally got Brexit done, of course. He was the most charismatic and, I think, consequential politician in a generation, known, of course, only as Boris. But Boris was sort of found wanting in, in high office and he's now been dumped. So we've got a new leader. And Kevin, you asked me earlier what I, what I would think of, uh, of Liz Truss. Well, I guess the jury's out, but uh, she clearly doesn't have that extraordinary ability of, of Boris to inspire and, and connect with people. And she doesn't have his instinctive political nous. But she's a free marketeer. Uh, she's principled. She's hardworking. She's resolute and she's determined, and she knows that the, the status quo of big government, tax and spend, and this pervading sense of entitlement has just got to change. Now, she's pretty obviously got a bodging in tray, an unenviable task, and a general election only two years away, but I think she's prepared to be bold and decisive, and I guess I think we're seeing that today a little bit with this energy announcement. And even if it makes taking some unpopular decisions in due course, I don't think she should be underestimated. She could lead the most radical conservative administration since Thatcher. But make no mistake, we badly need it. Well, what happens in UK politics, having got that out of the way and answered your question earlier, Kevin? <laughs> to some extent, I hope. Um, what happens in UK politics sort of keeps us amused, but it's not, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not that big globally. It's got sort of limited consequence. Although I, what I would say, is that a strong leader here in the UK would be welcome at a time when there's a growing absence of American leadership, fairly obviously, and a vacuum of leadership across the, across the West. And the challenges that the West face are, I think, the most demanding since the Second World War. Now, it's not exactly difficult to identify those challenges. Uh, war in Europe with consequences really yet unfolding. Highest inflation in 40 years, energy and food price shocks, crippling disposable incomes, we've heard a lot about it in the last couple of days. Gas shortages and rationing in Europe in the coming winter, possibly. The sharpest tightening in monetary policy in a generation. China's stalled economy in the face of zero COVID restrictions, the regulatory clampdown we heard about earlier, deleveraging in the, in the property industry. The housing market, not just in China, but I, but every, sort of, I think everywhere across the world are facing, facing a pretty sharp slow, slowdown or setback. Uh, the corporate sector, obviously constrained by supply shortages for the last two or three years, now with rising input prices, facing a, a profit downturn as wage costs rise and, and margins are squeezed. The era of globalization, key driver of growth and prosperity over the past 40 years, going into reverse. Uh, and uncertainty around the Iran nuclear deal with the West and fears for how this whole China-Taiwan question is ultimately going to be resolved. And then to cap all of that, We've got these midterm elections coming up in the US, which could result in a lame duck administration, I might say more of a lame duck administration, and open the, the, uh, the door to the return of, of Trump. Have I missed anything, Mark? Good. <laughs> anyway, let me try and to, to, to provide some, uh, some perspective. Uh, first, geopolitics. Clearly, the, uh, the invasion of, of Ukraine has, has dominated everything this year quite rightly, but there are these two other trouble spots, the China-Taiwan issue and the renegotiation of the Iran nuclear deal, which Trump abandoned. It does seem that progress is being made on the, um, on the nuclear deal, uh, and the deal, I think, is probably likely, so sanctions will be lifted in return for, um, for kicking the nuclear can down the road. Uh, I guess that it leaves the problem of a nuclear-armed Iran for the next generation of leaders in the West to face, but at least in the short to medium term, it eases the energy crisis as Iran's oil returns to world markets. And as Gust Gustavo told us earlier, China's intent to, um, to reunify Taiwan is, with, with the mainland, of course, is, is, uh, is altogether much more difficult, probably the biggest single geopolitical 
issue we, uh, we, we face. Complicated, of course, by Taiwan's 60% market share in global semiconductor production and this uh, in America's strategic ambiguity, which Gustavo referred to in its relationship with, um, with Taiwan. Tensions have obviously risen uh, in recent years, but I, I think China is likely to be, to be patient. Uh, after all, it's tolerated the current situation for about 70 years. And of course, China will not have missed this robust reaction of the West to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think a military invasion of, of Taiwan, which is a, clearly a very well-armed island state, would be immensely risky and damaging. More likely, there'd be a blockade. Uh, and maybe China's reaction to uh, Pelosi's visit recently is a sort of harbinger of, of what's to come. Uh, but that would also entail just tremendous risk and cost. I, I think China's so preferred solution must be a, a renegotiated or negotiated reunification, uh, leaving Taiwan with considerable autonomy, uh, although the mainland's clamped down on, on Hong Kong, uh, sort of um, in, in that context doesn't, doesn't set an encouraging uh, sort of precedent. Uh, although Tom Norton, I thought, made an interesting comment uh, yesterday. He, ch he believes that China, a successful Hong Kong will be good for future negotiations uh, with Taiwan, so probably the worst of the clampdown is over. From an investment perspective, it's, it's impossible to put a meaningful price on these sorts of risks. Any serious act of aggression by China would have such catastrophic implications. It's this classic sort of low probability, uh, high impact event. So we don't factor it explicitly into our forecasts. If we did, we'd end up with too few risks in portfolios. So sort of near certain damage to long-term returns. And history has shown us time and again that it's unwise to build portfolios primarily around the threat of big geopolitical events. It could be a long and costly wait in terms of returns foregone. History also shows us that geopolitical events which result in sharp falls in markets, create outstanding valuation opportunities. Tom again made an excellent point uh, yesterday when he noted that investors are prepared to accept the investment risk of companies like Apple and, and Tesla, which rely heavily on China for sales and manufacturing, yet those same investors have abandoned Hong Kong due to the crackdown on freedoms and pushed valuations to distress levels. And we've seen that time and again uh, over the years. And similarly, Gustav uh, this morning highlighted the opportunities in Asian high-yield bonds, a big part of which, of course, are China's property companies, and seemingly priced for the worst outcome. Appropriately sized, investments in these areas provide some outsized upside potential and also some good diversification benefits. What is beyond dispute is the belief that China's emergence as a global economic powerhouse would be followed by a shift towards liberal democracy and closer integration into the world order has plainly been uh, mistaken. Under Xi, China has turned back to autocracy and a totalitarian state, and relations with the West have deteriorated substantially. Globalization has peaked, with the world dividing into these two blocks centered on the US and China, and supply chains are shifting, self-sufficiency and security prioritized, as Capriet showed us this morning. Some of the gains from globalization, lower costs and rising real, real incomes, could well reverse uh, in the years ahead. The war in, in Ukraine has, has obviously not gone to, uh, to Putin's plan, but it really would be wishful thinking for him to back down. We're in what appears to be this stalemate, this long attritional campaign from which neither Ukraine, backed by, of course, Western military assets and money, nor Russia can withdraw. A key part of, of Putin's strategy is to fracture Western unity. And he's stepping up the pressure, as we're seeing now, as we enter this crucial winter period by cutting gas supplies. Uh, the EU faces the clear possibility of gas shortages this winter, paying the price, incidentally, for a disastrous policy of dependency on Russian gas. As households and businesses face these crippling costs, will the resolve of the EU weaken? It wouldn't be the first time that member states faced with adversity have put their own interests ahead of those of the EU and its partners. And it's a stark reminder too, incidentally, of this critical interplay between energy, power, and geopolitics. Although the unity is held so far, there are a few signs of cracks appearing, and I think the real test lies ahead. But I suspect that ultimately, unity will prevail. Unlike with the EU, Russia has very little leverage over its two main protagonists, the US 
and the UK, and their resolve, along with Poland and the Baltic states, is beyond question. Right across the West, there's a powerful view that Russia's this outrageous act of aggression simply cannot be allowed to succeed. It means that Europe faces a very tough winter as sky-high energy prices take their toll, but we'll get through it. The intense uncertainty and wide range of potential outcomes highlight the challenges faced by central banks. <coughs> How far will they be prepared to tighten policy to control inflation when the global economy is anyway entering a downturn? And given that, that central bank tools work essentially on excess demand rather than supply shocks, which we've obviously got now in energy and to some degree in food, how deep and prolonged will the slowdown need to be to bring inflation back to target levels of around 2%? This will surely be a key determinant of the course of markets in the year ahead. The inflation problem that, that central banks are tackling is partly of their own making. I think it was Gustavo that referred to that again this morning. For too long, they remained in a deflationary mindset and pursued ultra-loose ultra policy, despite the, the evidence of excess demand as the post-pandemic reopening surge hit those supply chain uh, disruptions. Putin's war exacerbated the problem, uh, but the rise in inflation was broadening and becoming embedded well before then. Items with stickier prices, which change relatively infrequently, have seen their inflation rate in the US move from not much more than 1% on a three months annualized basis in late 2020 to 7% now. And those prices are less responsive to economic conditions, and so they sort of build in expectations about future inflation to a greater degree than the flexible prices like food and, and energy. Uh, Greg of JP Morgan showed the same pattern, incidentally, with core prices in Europe, although he also made the point that there is sort of some pass through of energy inflation into core prices. So as oil prices fall, and we are seeing that at the moment, core inflation will ease a bit. But the task of bringing inflation under control has become more difficult. And it does incidentally go quite a long way to explaining the Fed's increasingly hawkish stance this year. Reining in inflation will entail a more restrictive policy for longer, a message to which the markets have been adjusting uh, in recent weeks. Judging how far rates will, will have to rise is, is difficult, but one thing I'm absolutely certain of, is this is not a repeat of the last great in inflation surge in the 1970s, which I worked through incidentally, ushered in Volcker, 20% Fed funds, and a deep and long recession. Inflation is much lower now than then. It's been high for only a year. And debt levels as a proportion of GDP are much higher now than then. So the economy is more sensitive to changes in interest rates. Financial conditions have already tightened substantially. Expansion of the money supply in the US has been falling sharply. It was over 25% in the US 18 months ago. It's down to about 5% now, so the more normal average. And the economy is definitely slowing. Leading indicators have fallen, some into contractionary territory, and confidence of consumers and businesses is in sharp decline across the US, UK, and Europe. And of course, the falls in, in commodity prices since March will help to, to bring inflation down. There are signs that these supply chain shortages are beginning to ease. Although there's a long way to go to normality, it looks to me as if the worst of the supply crisis is probably behind us, and it will be helped as China's COVID restrictions, restrictions are eventually lifted, which of course they will be. I mean, the other important thing to bear in mind is that market expectations of, of longer-term inflation remain within the range of the past decade. Uh, the five-year, five-year forward inflation rate in the US, which reflects market expectations of inflation five years from now, for the subsequent five years, it's a key indicator, incidentally, for the Fed, is around 2.5%. So there's no alarm bells ringing there. And Greg made the same thing about Europe yesterday. So I think there are grounds for believing that inflation, that the peak in inflation is not far away. It'll take time to fall back to central bank target levels of around 2%. Uh, indeed, uh, Gaprit, I thought was really good this morning, explaining that the longer term implications of the five Ds deglobalization, decarbonization, destabilization, demographics and digitization are likely to result in higher inflation in the future. So that 2% target might not be realistic, but a sustained change in, in direction will provide much needed encouragement for markets. And the falls in the first half of next year inflation are likely to be quite sharp. The biggest risk, I think, is what's happening to natural gas prices, especially in Europe. Putin is obviously using gas as a weapon of, of war, and supplies to Germany have now been cut off uh, completely. 
but the EU has been sourcing alternative supp supplies, admittedly at ever higher prices, hence this great surge we've seen. Um, and even after the sharp falls, incidentally, in the past uh, week or so in natural gas prices, it's still about, up, up about 10 times since before the pandemic in Europe. Um, there's been a, a direct knock-on effect on gas prices, of course, around the world, particularly here in the, in the UK. And power prices have reached just absolutely extraordinary uh, levels, delaying the, the, uh, the peak in inflation. Uh, the scale of the energy shock in Europe was, was illustrated, I think, very well by, by Greg, overwhelming the positives that he talked about, and at worst, knocking up to 4% of German GDP. Now, it's going to take time for the EU to replace that 40% of its gas that, that came from Russia before the war, but the crisis has galvanized action. Uh, Greg explained how rapidly the EU has moved to refill storage, creating quite a sizable buffer now, and also in finding alternative sources of supply. And I gather today these big LNG ships have sailed into Germany. So a bit of good news. So I think it's, it's possible that shortages will be limited uh, in the winter, buying time for those longer term alternative supplies to be put in place. Now the adjustment is gonna take several years. The short term uncertainty is considerable and the next few months will definitely uh, be challenging, but it seems to me that this extraordinary volatility in gas and power prices of the past few weeks is probably the period of peak fear before prices begin to, to fall back. The surge in inflation, especially food and energy, is really damaging. Disposable incomes are under pressure. Uh, companies are feeling the strain. Energy consumption is being cut and economies made, and we might be lucky with a mild winter uh, ahead in Europe, uh, but much of that energy spending is non-discretionary, so something has to give. That's something in the, in the UK uh, now looks like a further major government intervention. So Liz Trust's free market ear roll is, is uh, being challenged by having to sign a check for a, well, actually, it's, I think it's a blank check, but at least 100 billion pounds today, uh, just as incidentally many EU countries have, have introduced. It leaves the, uh, the pain in the short term, and I think was, was probably unavoidable. It does leave the cost to future generations. And there's simply no escape, escape in the reality of a direct loss to the economy, broadly equivalent to the extra cost for energy that goes abroad. So I say roll on North Sea exploration licenses, fracking and wind farms across England's green and pleasant land, as long as it's not Leicestershire, that is, of course. Um, I can actually think, seeing you sitting there, Andrew, I can actually think of a very good place for that sort of thing, which is North Yorkshire. Um, and of course, your MP, Rishi Sunak, has got nothing to do for the next couple of years before he goes back to California, so he could get it all done for you. <laughs> good luck on that. You're going to get 25% electricity cost reduction when they start fracking, incidentally. Excellent. Not in Leicestershire. Uh, the combination of falling real incomes and rising rates is a serious headwind for the housing market, too, of course. Uh, affordability is anyway stretched. Who was it? Was it uh, Gustavo showed that, I think, earlier? By uh, several years of real house price growth in many countries. And housing, of course, is typically the biggest component of household wealth. It drives a large part of economic activity, while banks have big exposure by, um, th by uh, mortgage debt. The 30-year mortgage rate in the US, which is a key, a key rate, is doubled this year to 6%, the highest since 2008. And new home sales are falling sharply down by about 13% over the last three months. So the cyclical downturn in the housing market just seems inevitable. It's underway here, I think. But central banks are in no mood to ease off on monetary tightening. At Jackson Hole, Powell left no room for doubt about the Fed's resolve. The Fed's gonna to tolerate tougher economic conditions to bring inflation firmly under control. And of course, they flagged the need for an extended period of higher interest rates and below trend growth. Policy tightening has got further to run. And that extends not just to interest rates, but which I think are gonna reach 4% in the US in the first half of next year. That's pretty much what the market expects now, seems reasonable, uh, but also to, uh, to quantitative tightening as the Fed removes liquidity from markets, reversing that huge post-pandemic QE program. QE, QT is at an early stage. It's only just moved to the Fed's target of $95 billion a month of liquidity reduction. That's about a billion dollars on an annualized basis, just starting, much larger than the post-GFC QT, which peaked at about 50 billion a month and totaled 650 billion before they capped it. That 650 billion could be reached by early next year in this cycle. 
So as rates go up and liquidity dries up, a period of deleveraging is underway. Speculative assets, which rose sharply on, on cheap and abundant money, they've already fallen a long way, but could still be vulnerable to further falls. The bigger danger, though, uh, is if more broadly based assets like real estate and parts of the credit markets uh, get exposed. On the positive side, the tighter money can, combined with economic slowdown could well generate that creative destruction that's been missing in the post-GFC era. Zombie companies should fall by the wayside and release capital for more productive enterprises. Similarly, those countries with, with high debt levels face sustainability problems. Greg yesterday highlighted the, the uh, seemingly perennial Italian problem. Spreads between Italian and German bonds have widened significantly. Uh, the ECB's new measure to prevent financial fragmentation within the currency bloc, it isn't quite the, the sort of will do whatever it takes moment of Draghi to preserve the euro, but it does look like a big step to prevent contagion as policy is, is tightened. And then there's the dollar. There's been some discussion about the dollar today. It surged high. It's up nearly 20% to a 20-year high on a trade-weighted basis in the past 12 months. And a strong dollar is certainly deflationary for large parts of the world, as, as we discussed earlier. Uh, nearly all commodities and goods are traded in dollars, and most international debt is in dollars. So a rising dollar pushes costs and liabilities higher. It's an integral part of the, financial of the tightening of financial conditions this year. And although the dollar is overvalued on a PPP basis and will in due course fall, uh, it, would be a, it would be a brave bet, to, bet against it in the, in the short term, given this greater resilience of the US in the current energy crisis, and indeed the faster pace of monetary tightening in the US than elsewhere. The Fed's balancing act is really very difficult. An overkill is certainly a risk, uh, but a soft, a soft landing, that sort of best case outcome, can't be completely ruled out. Indeed, Gapreet told us that that's basically the Goldman view, albeit with a pretty narrow path, as she described it, to getting there. Uh, and Greg yesterday from JP Morgan made a similar comment about the EU. He expects any recession to be mild relative to the size of the shock and the economy to be recovering by the second half of next year. The world is much better positioned to withstand a downturn than in the financial crisis, and indeed in, in many other recessions. Households and businesses enter the the, uh, the slowdown in, in good shape. They're not generally overstretched. Labor markets are, are strong. You can't get labor in this country. Unemployment levels low. Savings were built up during the pandemic and household balance sheets are healthy. Most companies have enjoyed strong uh, post-pandemic profits and they've cut debt levels, leaving them well prepared to ride out this tougher period ahead. And there are far fewer imbalances today requiring painful adjustments compared with the GFC and no significant systemic risks in sight. Uh, while loan losses will obviously uh, build as the slowdown bites, banks are in a very strong financial condition with ample capital buffers. And this is gonna to help to minimize the slowdown ahead and gives economies the, bounce, the, 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 the scope to bounce back quite quickly. But it's not very difficult to make a bearish case for the next few months and, and maybe uh, beyond, but investing is, is never quite uh, so easy. When the, when the 24 hour squawk boxes tell us incessantly that we're going to hell in a handcart, then you can make a reasonable assumption that a lot has been discounted already. And markets invariably offer the best opportunities when fear and uncertainty are at their greatest. The carnage across virtually all financial markets and asset classes this year might not yet represent the moment of maximum risk aversion and capitulation, but it's brought that time much closer. The Fed is front-loading front policy tightening. More tightening earlier means less tightening later. Peak inflation is approaching, and peak interest rates won't be far behind, with nearly all the Fed's rate rises in place by the end of this year. The market is probably over-optimistic in pricing rate cuts next year, but an end to that period of hawkish tightening will be an important turning point in the cycle. I think we're likely to see lower volatility of both rates and bonds as we move into 2023 with the biggest moves then behind us. And the energy crisis, it will be resolved in time and the cycle will in due course turn. So it seems to me that we've got an extended period of moderate financial stress ahead with the Fed getting to around this 4% level on Fed funds and maintaining that rate for some time, but not at a level which would push the economy into a deep and prolonged recession 
nor cause long-lasting scars. With inflation and interest rates in Europe likely to peak later than in the US, the conditions for a weaker dollar will be created, an important shift that would support risk assets right around the world. In this sea of uncertainty, one trend seems certain, and I don't think anybody in our industry can ignore it. As, as Vilma of Rubico said earlier today, climate change is gonna be at the center of, uh, of institutional investors' investment policy in future. We see a similar trend among retail investors. She made a powerful case for combining the best of active and passive in, in building sustainable equity portfolios, highlighting the weaknesses in passive indices and the one-dimensional approach and the concentration risks. And recent events, of course, have highlighted the moral dilemmas, the need for a, a more flexible, active approach in areas like energy and weapons. And as she said, we have fully embraced Rubico's approach and partnered with them in building our own sustainable global equity fund. On the, on the subject of um, active and, and passive, incidentally, I thought Gopreet's comments uh, this morning saying the investment opportunities in fixed income are going to be uh, alpha rather than beta going forward. Does that rather resonate with me? It, 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 looks, it looks to me like an era of sort of active and of being the winning approach here. Um, Ashish of, of IKEA yesterday also emphasized the importance of these sustainability factors that, uh, that Wilma talked about, especially governance when investing in, emer in emerging markets. Uh, I think it's pretty important, an asset class where he sees good long-term opportunities but require this sharp focus uh, on, on, uh, on quality and stewardship to minimize the risks of emerging, in emerging to, to invest in emerging markets. Uh, Prusik and, uh, and Ashmore are finding very good value in parts of the emerging market universe too, views which we, we share and we are impl implementing via these, these managers. Both of them, incidentally, are good examples of managers uh, where the depth of our research has given us the confidence to invest at a very early stage in their business life cycle. There's been no hiding place for investors this year. Uh, we are in truly turbulent times and markets might not yet have found that ultimate flaw, but it's not a time to be selling. Equities and bonds have already fallen sharply, and as several of our speakers highlighted, valuations have improved substantially, and there are some outstanding opportunities opening up. Even in safe haven bonds, an asset class that was pushed to unsustainably low valuations by zero rates and QE, the big sell-off this year is bringing valuations into more sensible territory. Not yet perhaps especially good value, but that time could well come in the next few months and we'll be looking out for further falls that take real yields on 10-year treasuries, currently around 75 basis points, closer to that 1.5 to 2% range in which they traded pre-GFC. Well, I, I do share Gustavo's view that he made earlier that these high debt levels we've got today are likely to keep those real rates somewhat lower than in previous cycles. Markets will in due course start to, to discount the turn in the cycle which lies ahead. Disinvesting and waiting on the sidelines for it to arrive is likely to leave other investors to enjoy the fruits of that recovery. Uh, during this tough period, I think there are two investment principles that are more important than ever. First, sticking to a robust, resilient, tried and tested investment philosophy. Our longer term valuation analysis gives us the confidence to stay with assets when they are at attractive valuations, even in tough times, as well as shifting tactically when periods of volatility create opportunities. And our blending of different equity styles means we avoid concentration risk in individual styles and ensures we, we consistently capture that long-term outperformance characteristics of selective styles while reducing volatility, as, as Alex elegantly showed uh, earlier on. Both Mark Baribo and Patrick Megan uh, yesterday, two of the outstanding style-specific global managers we use, they made, I thought, pretty powerful cases for the long-term attractions of growth and value stocks, respectively, of course, and also a good shorter term, term case too. And Alex illustrated the benefits of blending these styles along quality, resulting in big reductions in volatility while capturing their excess returns. I thought Mark and Patrick's different, differing views, I guess they've sort of got some biases, haven't they? But their differing views about which style will, will outperform in the short term just emphasizes the importance of blending styles. Style timing is really very difficult indeed. The second thing is that careful diversification is absolutely vital. Again, Alex provided a really good illustration of the weakness of the traditional 60-40 approach and the benefits in terms of return and risk of much broader 
and true diversification. And Fred Ingham of Newberger yesterday showed a range of hedge, hedge fund strategies which display that low volatility, low correlation with equities and bonds. That, that uh, multi-strategy hedge fund we use in our multi-asset portfolios, incidentally, is one of our best performing assets this year, almost double digit returns at a time when, as you all know, positive returns have been in pretty short supply. Exactly the sort of non-correlated returns that we see. We've taken uh, diversification progressively broader in recent years, capturing opportunities uh, in areas like private equity, Tim Creed dis discussed that yesterday, um, and in asset classes which are either relatively new or are becoming available much more widely in liquid form, green energy, infrastructure, we've talked about in battery storage, specialist areas of, of fixed income, uh, and social housing. And, and Giles introduced us to IMPP today which, with, with some really attractive uh, sort of inflation-linked returns. And Gareth Jones uh, yesterday to Home REIT, which we hold as well, a good example of how a social good can be delivered while generating stable and, and reliable returns to investors. So blending risk assets with defensive and non-correlated assets like these helps to protect capital on the downside and it smooths the journey, giving investors that confidence to, to stay invested and ensures too that full advantage is taken of the longer term opportunities that we see emerging. Picking low points in the cycle and timing re-entry into markets is notoriously difficult. Few ever succeed. Much better now to stay invested, caref carefully diversified, ride out the storm and be positioned to take full advantage of the recovery which definitely lies ahead. Thank you very much indeed for listening for so long, Mark. Your, your, um... <laughs> I'm not going to take questions. I know you want time for your afternoon nap. So, um, uh, but I do want to do just a final word of thanks uh, for following on from Andrew uh, yesterday. This, this event simply couldn't happen without all of you. We massively appreciate your attendance. We know it's a big ask to come in many cases all around the world here. It's terrific. And it's great to catch up, of course, personally with, uh, with so many of you. So thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate uh, your support. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here. Um, and, um, and then I just wanted to thank my colleagues uh, here in Momentum in London as well as in South Africa for all the effort. I mean, something like this doesn't just happen click of the finger, as you well imagine. There's been a ter terrific amount of work. There's been lots of people here from Momentum supporting us today. But uh, there are a number of people that I particularly wanted to mention. Becky and Libby, who have been helping uh, today, uh, I think Dan yesterday uh, uh, out there. And then there are three p particular people I wanted to to, uh, to draw attention to, uh, who I hope are all in, in the room. Um, Renee from South Africa, who, Renee, please come forward. Renee has looked after all the sort of platform side of things. <laughs> Renee's looked after all the platform side of things and irritated us all intensely by her intention to detail and <laughs> But terrific, Renee, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Don't. And then two of my colleagues from London, who I see at the back there, Steph, please come forward. Steph, you all would know by now, she's got, got uh, tremendous, tr tremendous attention to detail as well. And uh, if anything ever needs to be done, then uh, you can turn to Steph, she's hugely helpful. Uh, and uh, has been p participating, well, actually right through the last six months in helping us to get organized. So, Steph, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and then last but by no means least, I can see Esther at the back there. Uh, Esther, I can tell you, starts work on this in about February, uh, and it's absolutely incessant. Um, She's got a huge attention to detail. She's passionate about it. She owns this, this conference. Uh, most of my colleagues, in fact, all of my colleagues will know that if you're late or you haven't done something uh, properly, then uh, Esther's going to be on your, uh, on your case very quickly indeed. And incidentally, uh, many of you might have noticed that hammering and knocking uh, yesterday morning. And you'll also notice that it stopped pretty quickly because Esther went out and tackled the builders and... Uh, <laughs> And they didn't start again. Anyway, Esther's been, been absolutely uh, terrifically hardworking, uh, resilient in some challenging times, but everything comes together. Uh, thanks very much to you, Esther. So please come forward.
Well done, Esther. Thank you.